Hi, I'm Greg. Welcome to Affect Studio. I want to talk about the history of Ibanez musician basses and how I came to rediscover their brilliance, ending up with six of them. Ibanez made the musician bass from 1979 through to 1987, although there are some from the very end of 78. There were at least two models produced in the 90s that were only available in Japan. They were continuously revising the design, and I don't think any version stayed the same for more than two years. They used the same model numbers for most of the revisions, which makes things confusing. There isn't a great deal of information about these, but from what I can gather, starting in the mid-70s, Ibanez, along with other Japanese instrument manufacturers, having shown they could make first-rate copies of existing designs, were attempting to show they could outdo the US builders with their original models. As such, they weren't worried too much about making money on the instruments produced for export, just trying to establish themselves as being the best. If you look at their late 70s from mid 80s catalogues, you realise they didn't produce any entry level instruments. The beginner instruments were branded CMAR. The cheapest Ibanez basses were the Roadster, then Blazer, which were at least as good as any 70s Fenders. I understand they gave instruments to well known players, which is why you see so many of them pictured in Ibanez catalogues. Obviously, they needed to be good instruments or the players wouldn't have used them. I'm going to go through my musicians in roughly chronological order, which isn't the order in which I bought them. I won't be talking about every variation, as there are just too many of them. The features common to all of them are the through-body five-piece tuned response neck, made of three pieces of maple and two strips of walnut with different length steel bars to prevent dead and hot spots. I don't know if they were the first to use the bars, I'm yet to find an earlier example. The neck design seems to be the key to the incredibly balanced tone and response, as it's about the only thing that stayed constant on all musicians. They all feature a high mass quick release bridge. The bridge design changed regularly, but all had the quick release tailpiece section. Once again, I haven't found anybody doing it earlier. Don't know why everyone doesn't use this concept, as I hate the sound of my expensive strings scraping through a bridge. The active models, which were usually given the MC924 designation, had ebony fingerboards, and the passive models, which were usually MC824s, had rosewood boards. This is an April 1980 model MC924, and the second version of Musician, introduced in late 79. Very similar to the original MC900s, they were passive basses with a three-band inductor-based EQ and active boost, so you can run them with or without the EQ. Where they differ is that this one adds a passive tone control, which like the passive volume control is always in the circuit, and 24 frets where the originals had 22. They move the bridge pickup closer to the bridge and the jack to the side on these. The bridge is slightly different too. The neck pickup is in the same position as the original 22 fret models and has my favourite neck position tone of all of mine, not an ideal position for slap players. The middle position sounds unique due to the wider pickup spacing. This is exactly the same as one of the two musicians Adam Clayton used in U2 from 80 to 84. He also owned the passive MC824 version, which he seemed to favour. He's notable for not having appeared in any of the Ibanez catalogues. I'm playing these through a Mark Bass head into a dark glass cab mic'd with the EV RE20. The settings will be unchanged, so any tonal changes are coming from the basses. <laughs> My fretless MC940 is my second oldest musician, but most recent purchase, built in July 1980. In the three months between this and the last one, they've moved the pickup slightly further from the neck and changed the truss rod cover from two screws to three, otherwise the same specifications. A fretless 79 model musician is the bass sting used more than any other in the police, although he had other musicians including an 8-string and some one-off versions. There seem to have been a number of one-off musicians, along with some unusual variations, like the Alfonso Johnson model that was fretless above the 12th fret. The bodies in the first three years were a sandwich with the mahogany core and ash front and back, although there were a couple of limited editions that used different combinations of timbers. The fretless musicians have always been held in high regard. The neck construction helps make these some of the best fretlesses ever made. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
is my first musician, a January 1981 version I bought in 1983. In the five months between the fretless and this, they've moved the neck pickup again and refined the EQ. You can see the progression of the neck pickups with my three here. This is my favourite version of the EQ because they changed the boost to a boost cut which I find way more useful. They also added extra filtering to make the EQ quieter. I added the extra filtering to my 980 fretted model as it was very noisy and modified it to have the boost cut. For some reason the fretless has the same version of EQ as the first one and isn't noisy at all, so I left it stock. The neck is slightly thicker on this one, although I haven't played two that were exactly the same. I believe the musicians were largely handmade, which accounts for the variations. Other than a refret and the change machine heads, this one is completely stock. Oh, and I've replaced the EQ knobs on all of them as they disintegrate over time. The others we've heard have hum cancelling versions of these Super 4 pickups that sound the same without the hum. I'll get to that later. This one has flat wounds on it and I'll demonstrate the EQ this time. <laughs> I played this extensively for a few years before returning to mainly playing guitar, eventually selling it to a friend I'd started a band with. Almost 30 years later I got a call from him asking if I wanted to buy my bass back. I pointed out that it wasn't mine, I'd owned it for just over 3 years and he'd had it for almost 30. The biggest issue with most musician basses is the weight. This one weighs 5.2 kilos or 11.5 pounds. While I always loved this bass and had occasionally considered buying another one, I initially declined buying it back as I discovered in my early 20s I had permanent lower back and left shoulder damage from playing it while still growing. I was a few months off turning 15 when I bought it and very skinny. Standing for hours each week playing it wasn't healthy although I had no idea at the time. After reflecting on the great memories I had of the bass, how good it always sounded and the significant performances I, along with another mate who'd used it when I was on guitar, had done with it, not to mention all the gigs I did with the friend I sold it to, decided I did want it and bought it back. I'd returned to playing equal amounts of guitar and bass around 2000 and bought and sold a lot of basses, looking for the perfect one. I kept looking for a bass with an even response from string to string and up and down the neck, but none were as good as I wanted. The closest I got was an original Steinberger and a Dingwall Z3. This was the only bass my mate had owned in those 30 years and he'd played hundreds of gigs in that time. Consequently it was in desperate need of a refret. After getting it back from the luthier and playing it with a band, I realised why every bass I had tried left me dissatisfied. This was the bass I was looking for, except for the weight. Too heavy for me to play standing. So at this point I started looking for a lightweight version and discovered the MC888 Bean Bass. So this is my second musician. I was completely unaware of these. Looking up the old Ibanez catalogues, the only place they are featured is a Japanese magazine from 84 and a standalone advertisement. There's a picture of Gary Beers from Excess playing one on a Roadster bass page after they'd stopped making these. Exactly the same as a passive MC824 from 83 and 84 with a smaller body and headstock. They're constructed the same way as the full body models and have the standard 34 inch scale. Really quite a brilliant design as they balance well on the strap and this one is only 3.5 kilos or 7.7 pounds. I found them on price lists and they sold for the same price as the full bodied passive MC824s. Slightly less wood but no less work to produce. For some reason I installed an EQ on this one even though I rarely use them. It's currently bypassed. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
1982, they changed from the original soap bar style Super 4 pickups to the Super P4 and Super J4 pickups. The P4 is a very hot pickup. They swapped the pickup selector switch for a pickup blend control, which I prefer, and the MC924 lost the active boost cut. In 83, they changed to this bridge, which has a hinge and a single height adjustment screw. The body's also changed from ash mahogany sandwich to solid ash. After buying this, I realised I had seen them before. John Entwistle has one in his book that he describes as an Ibanez mini bass. I'd also seen photos of Adam Clayton playing one in the studio during the Zuropa sessions and assumed it was a Roadstar. I noticed Adam was using his, which has clearly seen a lot of use, for With or Without You on their last tour, which makes me wonder if he played it on the original. This one's from April 1984. It has the same even response as the full-bodied one, but doesn't sound the same as the older ones. I really wanted to sound the original bass, so to hear if it was due to the pickups, I tried one of the Super 4 pickups from my original musician in the neck position, and they sounded almost identical. So I really needed to find an earlier single-coil Super 4 pickup to go on this one. Sometime later I found this one, which was from December 83, so slightly older than the black one. This is my fourth musician. You can see the neck construction is the same as the full-size ones. This is the same weight as the black one, it has the thinnest neck of all of them. It's the only one that still has the original machine heads. They're known to break. My original had them replaced when I got it back, and I changed the others as a preventative measure. I've kept the originals in case I need to sell the bases. While searching for Super 4 pickups, I discovered Ibanez made 15 30th anniversary models in 2009. According to the brochure, they used the Super 4 pickups that I prefer in a wooden cover and the original EQ. Given the original retail price of these, I found a couple that were still for sale from new, but then found a used one that after shipping was going to be about double what the original was selling for. I inquired about the weight and was told 4.3 kilos. Brilliant, I'll take it. So this was my third musician. The craftsmanship of this bass is the best I've ever seen. In fact, I thought they'd used a lightweight bridge on it until I tried to remove it and discovered it had been recessed so well it looked like it had a thin bass plate. Same with the cover for the rear cavity. So well routed you could almost not use the screws. The bridge seems to be made from solid brass, so even heavier than the originals. I would have preferred it without the inlays, but a lot of people seem to love them. There are a few things that weren't right, first being the weight. While one of the lighter full-bodied musicians, it's still heavier than the seller claimed. So this sounds almost the same as my original, only problem being these aren't the original pickups or EQ. I made these as the ones that were in it were traditional humbuckers. Not a bad sound, but completely different to the Super 4s that were the whole reason I bought it. Completely different preamp too. I could only think they thought these would be bought by collectors who wouldn't play them, or that the single coils were too noisy for such a high-end bass. At the price they were asking, I wondered if they were hoping Sting and Adam Clayton would buy a pair each for old time's sake. The good part was I'd always wanted to wind pickups, so I learned how so I could make these. I initially made a copy of the original Super 4s and eventually came up with a hum cancelling design using side-by-side -side coils so it still sounds like a single coil. I had the same pickups and some 3D covers in the first three bases you heard. Ignoring this one, we stopped our journey in 1984. Ibanez continued producing musicians for another three years and made even more frequent changes, including slightly smaller bodies and active EMG style pickups, as opposed to the passive pickups in these with an active EQ. I haven't had any direct experience with those models, but believe they are as good, just different. And then there were the Japanese only versions in the 90s. They made a reissue of the 1981 model and another where the MC824 had a bolt on neck. So that's an overview and history of the Ibanez musician basses. While presumably influenced by makers like Alembic, they were quite an innovative and original design. The only issue is the weight. A mate found a 1981 model that was just over 4 kilos, so there is at least one lightweight full-bodied version out there. Seems people selling them have trouble with their scales, as I bought the first one I played in this video because it was supposed to be 4.2 kilos. It was about 4.7. So I have now bought two of them because they're advertised as being lighter weight than they are. So why do I like these so much? It's the consistency of the tone and evenness of the response, which means they sit well with a band 
and I really like the clear tone and clarity of the original Super 4 pickups. The PJ ones also sound great, and I know a lot of people prefer that version. As I said, I haven't had any direct experience with the models beyond these. A good friend of mine who knows my bass as well has recently bought one of the Active EMG style ones and is really liking that. And it's a different sound, but he's finally got the same consistency and evenness of tone and response. I've noticed parts recorded with any of these musicians require less work in a mix than other basses. I've done albums where it's the same player, but they've used musician for some tracks and other basses for others. And the musician tracks just seem to blend better. They just don't jump out or get lost. They just sit there the way you want them to. I occasionally see people saying they wish Ibanez would reissue these. Uh, my suspicion is they would cost too much to build. Look at the price of these 30th anniversary models from 14 years ago. The inlays alone were probably half the cost, but even without those, you'd still have an expensive base. So as always, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you soon.